Welcome to Schmidt List, a podcast on innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship. Join host Kurt Schmidt, president of Foundry, as he and his guest share valuable insights and strategies. This is the perfect opportunity to explore fresh ideas to improve yourself and your business. Come join Kurt as he interviews this week's inspiring guest. Heather, how are you today? I'm so good. How are you? Oh, living the dream, living the dream. Riding on cloud nine today. I'm, Excellent. you know. Okay. And I do have to say, your little book of networking is also like the perfect graduation gift for that kid that's going to college, which a lot are right now. So get them this book, set them up for their future. Oh, perfect. I'll give you the $20 later for that. So Heather, tell me about the work you do and who do you do it for? Yes. Okay. So I've got a marketing company called Vogel Venture and it's strategic marketing. So I do probably two services the most. One is fractional marketing leadership and the other is strategic marketing sessions for small businesses. I'd stay, I say I'm between two and 20 million in revenue. So I really go after that small business. A lot of times they have one person doing marketing tactics with no strategy or they have never done marketing at all. So I love working with small businesses directly with presidents and owners and CEOs and making quick decisions and moving their business forward quickly. Uh, that's great. I'm sure you get a lot of people showing up saying, people t- telling us if we should do this marketing thing and I don't know, what is it and all that stuff. And I'm guessing there's a lot of education in the work you do. Yes. And that's actually the most fun for me. So I also teach an undergrad marketing class at Metro State and education and teaching is part of what fuels my fire. And so I do come at it from very much an education standpoint, because as you know, you got to do the basics well. And so when they come to you wanting to do all the shining bells and whistles when you say, but what is your key messaging? What what do you actually do? And when they say what they do is very different than what's on their website, you know, you can help them. Yeah, that's great. Well, on top of that, you also recently launched a book. Do you want to talk about that too? Sure. Yes. Okay. So my book, it's a children's book. So everyone's out here writing their business and leadership (laughs) books. And I thought, you know what? I like birds. And so this is my book (laughs) called Little Birdie Buddies of Minnesota. And it's just been very much a labor of love. And we'll probably talk more today about following the yellow brick road and that this journey with my (laughs) birds has very much been. It started with this feeling in my heart that I had to draw again. Then I started drawing birds and then I started naming the birds and it all sort of turned into this idea for this children's book, which, yeah, I published in February and book number two is coming out in October. So, yeah, that's great. Well, and this is why I'm excited to talk to you because I, too, I run a business and I do some coaching and and I, I do some mentoring and I have a book and I have a family and all those things. And I get people all the time and I'm sure you do. How do you do all the things that you do, Heather? And so. Let's start from, as you mentioned, foundation. Let's start with the basics, right? Is, I'm guessing this wasn't, all these things weren't planned. You weren't just coming out of high school and going, boy, I can't wait to do all the things that is available. How did that progression start? And were you always good at managing that? Or did you did it take time to learn how to manage multiple sorts of priorities? Yeah, I mean, first of all, none of this was planned. <laughs> Me on my own business was not planned. The man I married was not planned. The book was not. So I actually am a big believer that the best things in life actually happen in the unplanned category. And we plan and we have goals and that's great. But the actual plan for your life always ends up being way better than you ever imagined it. And so for me, growing up in corporate for 22 years and as a type A achiever, which every day I'm trying to unwind a little bit more, <laughs> but, you know, you put the A's, you get the promotions. And I just felt like I, I knew that game and I knew that system. And after 22 years of corporate and kind of being tossed off the wheel a few times, it just felt like maybe there's something more and different. And I keep getting on this wheel and I keep getting rejected. You know, is there something different? And so I think for me, it's been being open and really thinking about life as that unique yellow brick road that we like all you can't screw your life up because it's yours. And all of our yellow brick roads are unique and beautiful and different. And so as I kind of took the traditional path, I just sort of sort sort of to feel I needed to open myself up to other things. And really, once I started to think, okay, maybe maybe getting another W2 job isn't the right path. It's interesting then how people started asking me if I was consulting and projects started to show up and And so the demand started to build and I didn't even have a plan for that. But I knew there was something there and I followed that. 
And then same thing with my birds. It was, okay, I've got this feeling in my heart that I have to draw again. The first thing that came through me was this little chubby bird. And I thought, I'm going to draw fat birds. And then that led to naming the bird. And then that name or led to me getting excited about birding and naming them and seeing them in the wild. And then the book started. So again, there was no plan for the book. It was step by step, what is unveiling in front of me? And then what spoke to me in terms of what brings me joy and what fills my heart? Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Because it is something about this sort of be careful what you wish for thing, right? Because there is this thing that's happened the last few years, right? The hashtag hustle culture, right? The yeah. side business, the gig mm -hmm. economy, the a lot, especially it's very attractive to a lot of young people, right? I've got this kind of crappy job and on the side, I'll start a an influencer business or I'll start a YouTube channel, whatever. And, and it seems like a lot of those things are directed more by the cash that you're mm -hmm. hoping to achieve versus the passion that you're trying to to fulfill yeah. on. So talk to me a little bit about that. Like how, yeah. how do you balance, how do you suggest to people balancing those sorts of things, right? Because obviously the majority of us, except for 1%, have to make money <laughs> to, to kind of keep our lives together. Yeah. And it can be attractive, these, these side things, right? You've got multi-level marketing schemes. I can, I can sell some leggings on Facebook to people. I can I, can. I would totally buy your leggings. Let me know where I, I do. can. Okay, well, good. Because I, I wait till the promo at the end. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But if there's all these things coming at us telling us that we should be doing more with what? With our time because hashtag hustle. And how do you look at those? How do you look at that culture? And what sorts of advice do you give people that are considering that or maybe burnt out by that? Yeah, I, I personally hate the hustle culture. And in the entrepreneurial world, it's very prominent and prevalent. And yeah. I think us work hard, but I also think to your point, we have to make money. I'm a big fan of what is enough. What is enough money? And even if you have a job that doesn't light your soul on fire every day, if you get paid well for your value, you like what you do, you enjoy your coworkers, again, is that enough? Do you have to be leading a company? Do you have to be making seven figures? What's interesting about my journey is in 2019, I lost my job for the fourth time. But in 2019 was the first time that me and my husband did the exercise of how much as a team do we need to make for us to live the life we want? And let me tell you, I'm chasing more and more and more. And I actually needed to make this. And so that really changed things for me. I really started to think about, okay, if I can make enough for what I get paid to do, which is my job, will that leave me space and time to do other things? And light, so oftentimes we think of, we've got two buckets. We've got the work bucket and the life bucket or the the person, the family bucket. So you've got family and you've got work. And there's like 17 buckets in between that we sort of forget about. It's the creative in you. It's how do you want to serve other people? It's what just simply brings you joy. It's how do you play? And so there's a lot of pieces to who we are. And somehow it's been reduced to what do you do to make money? And how do you provide for your family and spend time for your family? And so I just think that that balance piece comes to what is enough? And if we stop chasing more for more's sake, we might find that we can get what we need while also having way more space and joy and happiness because, you know, the people that make the most money are sometimes the most unhappy people. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's very common. I mean, I mean, look at the people who win lotteries, right? It's like 80 percent of them go bankrupt in a couple of years or something. Ah. So it's yeah, it's, sure. it's, well, and. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say it's, it's it's this misnomer that money can buy you happiness. It does to us. Like, if you, well, I think what was the the magic number for happiness was, and it's probably a little outdated now with inflation, but it was like $75,000. Like if you, yeah. your basic needs are being met and then some. So if you're making 20000 a year, yeah, if you make forty, that's going to significantly change your life and you might be happier. But once your basic needs are met, actually making more doesn't significantly make you a happier person. And I think COVID, there was a lot of lessons throughout COVID. And one of them was learning, what could we live without? You know, how much money did we save? Because we weren't going out and doing all the things. And while, yes, you don't want to maybe be at that extreme, it really did make you think about how you spend your money. And is it really aligning with your values? And do I have to be living that way? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the ozone layer repaired itself during 
<laughs> COVID. So That's I mean, a lot. <laughs> it's a, there's a there's a lot of change, positive change going on during it, even though it seemed like a very down down time i think like to your point it forced a lot of people to reflect <clears throat> and that's why we saw a lot of changes happening in the workplace right we saw the quiet quitting and the we're not going to take it anymore like i don't know what i don't know what version I, is, is, is it that's out there but yeah. let's talk about how i actually balance those things because maybe i'm listening to this heather and i'm like i've always thought about writing a book but i don't have the time for that i i don't i can't I can't do that, but I've always thought about it. I think it'd be really cool. And I've got some great ideas. What do you say to those people? Well, the interesting thing is we all have the same 24 hours in a day. We do. And I would ask you, we do have time. It, the question is, how are you prioritizing it? You've got time. You're just choosing to do something else with your time. And time is the number one resource, non-renewable, the most important thing we have. You can make more money. We can't make more time. And so I think protecting your time that is the biggest lesson that I've learned in year. So I'm in year two of, of my business. Last year, while it was great for many reasons, basically what I did was I replicated my corporate world with back-to-back -back meetings. And I was getting to like a 60-ish hour work week, which I didn't want to do. And then I realized that, you know what, I have to start protecting my time better because my goal for this year was to go to a four-day work week, which in April, I was able to get to that. But it meant protecting my time, saying no to things and getting really clear on what it was that I wanted to achieve. And those were the big rocks, right? And then everything else kind of floated around that. But you have to first establish what is important to you. And then literally, I block time for that. So for me, birding is super important to me. So every Monday morning from eight to noon, that is my birding time. I am out at the state parks and the trails looking for birds. And before I would have that time on my calendar, but somebody wanted to meet with me at nine on Monday. Okay, no problem. I can fit that in. And before I knew it, I'm giving myself away. I'm getting crabby and nobody's winning. And so it really started with identifying what are the things that are really important for me to be happy? Because that's what means a successful life to me. If I'm happy and I'm looking at my week ahead and I'm excited, but that means that I have to first define what I want. And then number two, I have to carve time out for it. Yeah, that's great. I, I, I have a similar philosophy because it, what's the name of that woman that does the organization show like on Netflix? Oh, Marie Kondo. Yeah. So I do Marie yeah. Kondo, but like with my calendar and my schedule, right? Do I, do I, does this bring me love? You know, right. I, I kind of, I kind of look at things that way because in order to bring new things into my life, other things have to be removed at, the, at this point, especially at my age. So it's the same thing with keeping the house organized, right? If I'm going to bring in new furniture, the old furniture has to leave. So if I want to work on my book, that means I don't get to watch as much Netflix as I might have done before, or I can't keep up with real estate housewives of wherever or whatever the show might be. I have to cut some things out in order to, to do that, right? Or I remember um, when I started working on my, my first online course for networking, I did HelloFresh for a couple of months because it made cooking easier. So there's yeah. things you can you can do. It's not first what can I add to things, but what can I what can I prioritize over those other things? I think really makes a big difference. Yeah, I agree. And part of it is just getting really honest with yourself about how you're spending your time. Yeah, I mean, a lot of us would probably be embarrassed to know how much time we spent scrolling social media. Honestly, <laughs> sure. Yeah. It's uh, those screen reports that come in. You're like, oh, God. Exactly. And there's that whole thing is, is what you're about to do is the decision you're about to make a vote for the person you want to be. Right. Yep. And so sometimes watching Housewives and like tuning out is exactly what you need. But if you're doing that too often and you're always defaulting to your phone, I just think getting away from screens in general, as I'm like looking at you on a screen, <laughs> I think that's so important. We've gotten so used to just kind of what's being fed in front of us. Yeah. And you defaulted to social media as our base baseline and our benchmark and our frame of reference when the human experience should be. And so I do think we have to be really diligent about towing that line and understanding that when we are diving into social media or scrolling through YouTube, it's, it's a choice. And we're not just constantly being fed something. We look up and it's been two hours and we've lost our evening. Yeah, that's a perfect example of things. Again, back to your point do an audit of what you're spending your time on because you can find the time 
to do these things. Because I say the same thing people always say to me, well, I can't network like that. I have a family and things like that. And I'm like, you're just, that's, you're full of crap because you're just not prioritizing it. You can, it's not important. It's not important to you. Yeah. 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 You're exactly right. And I remember it was last year, my husband kind of called me out. It was like, hey, we like haven't been on a date night in a while. What's going, like, I, you, you're doing this thing, which is great, but I thought you wanted to work less. And he, it's really important to have, whether it's a partner or someone in your life, they can call you on your BS because yeah. we will let ourselves get away with anything and everything. And when she kind of said, hey, like, we need to work on this. I thought, you know what? You're right. In terms of my priorities, you are one of the top five buckets that is important for me that I am filling and I'm nurturing. And yet I am not giving this enough time and energy. And so I just think we can say things, but then our actions always tell the truth. Always. Yeah. Uh, I've been working for years to get in my wife's top five buckets. You know, it's going to take a long time. (laughs) It's going to take a long time now. So you you launched your career, and I, I know a number of other professionals, especially during the pandemic, that decided to leave corporate America and pursue their own their own business, their own consultancy, and things like that. And and also, I've noticed it was a lot of professional women. What's if you were if one of my listeners is a is a is a you know, a woman in in kind of corporate America now, thinking about maybe moving into consulting or consultancy. What's sort of your top three things to think about before you you make that that move? What are some things that you wish you would have known or just what's your general advice if you talk to someone who's like, oh, wow, I'd really like to be doing what you're doing? Yeah, I would say the and because mine wasn't the plan, it's yeah, sort it, of it, just man started to build up. I actually I'm sort of a risk averse and a risk averse person by nature anyways. And so the fact that demand was building, it gave me the confidence to say, I'm going to take this risk. And so I think there's something to be said for whether it's a side hustle or whether you start talking to some people to see, it, is there demand there? I think to me, the scariest thing would be to come up with something, launch it, and then figure out how to get customers. So, <laughs> right. maybe, so maybe start with some customers first. And even if it's, hey, I can help you five hours a week. In fact, I had a side hustle in 2019 that is a, still a client of mine today. And it started as five hours a month. Like mm-hmm. they just want to, and so I didn't think it was going to turn into anything. It was just, hey, I want to help out. And and yep. so I maybe trying to create some demand. I would also say, understand what you need to make. That's really important. Know what that minimum is and be OK if you're a little less and be super grateful if you end up going past that. But that will also help you understand how you can then figure out, OK, by month or by quarter, how you're going to hit that financial goal, because I'm assuming that that is important. And then I would say, give yourself a thousand breaks. And once you're out of those breaks, give yourself a thousand more because yeah. it is hard. We are making stuff up as we go. Like when yeah. somebody first asked me for a proposal, I'm literally Googling um, proposal templates. I didn't know what I was doing. And I, I think the other thing is besides giving yourself some breaks, like tap into the amazing network that is here in Minneapolis. People are so generous and helpful and we all want to help like if you're going to come onto the island of entrepreneurship we want you to be happy we want you to stay and so tap in and don't be afraid to ask for help because everyone is so generous and we all just want to help yeah that's i I think that's so important what you just said because you can't you can't do it by yourself that's that's the first rule and so you maybe you have this sort of experience in corporate america where you kind of have to fight for your place in things and you can't bring that into entrepreneurship. No, in fact, that is like the best part of being an entrepreneur is that you are used to sort of peer groups are great, but also everyone's trying to make sure that they're fed and how do they look and they're rack and file. Yeah, Um, and why am I not in that meeting? (laughs) Yes, yes. And then you get into this world and it's like, oh my gosh, you need to look at these resources. You have to talk to this person. Oh, I'm going to this event. It is this wonderful, inclusive family feel that coming out of corporate, it it's almost like, is, are these people for real? And then you just realize that, oh my gosh, when people are allowed to build their own thing, now you're part of a community in a different way. And the give back, it's so real and yeah. different than, like, it's different in the best way. Yeah, it feels like a nice warm blanket, honestly. I That's what I tell people. Like, it, it's really... You get out of it a lot more than you can even put into it, but you got to start and you got to and you got to stay consistent. So yeah. let's talk about consistency. So you're running your own business. Yeah. How do you 
how do you personally juggle all the actually doing the work and the finding new business and all of those things? Because I know that's something that other people that are in your space always seem to find opportunities <laughs> with is, is being able, how do I, how do I do the business and not be in the business, but working on the business, but not be in the business? What are some of the lessons you've learned? Yeah. I think, first of all, the, the split that's working for me, at least right now with my four-day work week, is 70% client work, 30% operations, reaching out, networking. Like that's working for me right now. I also like to front load my year if I can. So if I can sort of hit my goal by, let's say, September, and I'll still work and have clients, but that just gives me that psychological buffer where it's all kind of gravy afterwards. So yeah, I sure. kind of like hit it hard. And especially in winter here in Minnesota, I am happy to work a little bit harder and then lay off a little bit more in the in the summer. And I would just say there is something about the universe that does right size itself. Because, for example, I have a client and I've been with them for a year and a half. I'm off boarding with them in August or I did. And this guy, three weeks before we made this decision, calls me and says, hey, I know I met you like a year ago. I think I want you to do marketing for me. I said, great, I've got capacity starting in August. And now he is one of my clients. Boom. And so it's one of those things where things do balance out in the weirdest way. I couldn't have predicted that, but it happened. And I've heard more and more stories of like, okay, this went away. And all of a sudden this happened because when something is off the plate, you're making room for something new and the universe will conspire for you. You have to believe that. And I would also just say, you know, having that faith that it's going to come. And then when it, if it doesn't come, Maybe take that sign as, okay, maybe I need to work on a new skill, but it's not panic mode. It's, this is giving me time to do something else. Maybe it is time to take that family vacation. And so I just think you got to have the faith, but keep those conversations going with new prospects because you are always planting seeds as an entrepreneur, always. And you just never know when they're blossom. Yeah. Cause I've seen people that are, they're full up with work. And so they're like, oh, I couldn't talk to these people or I couldn't spend any time on this. And it's like, no, you're doing this for future you, not for today you. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. And think about, okay, great. So I'm full right now. I'm always, I always tell people, I'm always willing to have a conversation. I have a conversation and I say, great. If you're willing to wait a few months, I am happy to work with you. If you're not willing to wait, I've got three people I could refer you to. And now sure. I'm help referral network. And that's also the beauty of this, of this community we have is when somebody's full, somebody else could use the work. So it'll, it'll always come back around. So what else do you do besides, obviously we talked about all the work sort of things. Are you a fitness person? Are you a mindfulness person? What sorts of other things do you do that helps you, that you found that helps you keep balance in the work that you're doing? Yeah, I am. I'm definitely a mindfulness person. I try to meditate three times a week. I am not really like a, a hardcore meditator, I meditate for five minutes. That's the kind of all I can do. I set my timer. There are many times I look at it and go, how has it only been two minutes and 50 seconds? But that's okay. I'm going to sit here and breathe. Um, but it does really center me. And I've never regretted taking that time. But every time I'm too busy, it's like it's only five minutes. It calms me, it centers me, and it helps me just think and kind of clear the deck. The other thing that I personally find to be important very important to my mental health is having a dog. And so we just had a foster fail. He was in our house for a week. And dogs, actually, I should say pets in general, are proven to lower blood pressure, boost your mood. And so getting out with him and taking him for a walk and I could be deep in something and he'll jump up and like destroy something. And I just laugh because it's just the key. like there's something about animals pulling you out of your moment and into the present. And just in a way that is so delightful. So I just think having a pet, like, please go get a pet. It is like the secret to joy, in my opinion. Um, and then I, I walk. I mean, I walk with my dog and that is kind of my fitness schedule. I like to do yoga. I am not a high impact anything. I don't like to run. I hate bike riding. So I, I will walk somewhere though and meet someone for a glass of wine. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a good that's a good place to walk to. Yeah, I, 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 I do, I do meditation, but I, they just end up being naps. That's really what it, it is for me. You know, what, you, know, you know what I would say to you is that that is what you needed. So you that's are absolutely what I yeah. needed. Now you could tell my wife that that would be great to like, just let her know that I'm doing mindfulness. It's not napping. Okay, 
No. Uh, okay. We'll tell you though, like in the scheme of like what we all want to be, we want to be the best at whatever. Why not be the best snapper? Like that could be a really great goal. Ooh. And I am actually a big fan of, I like a 17 minute nap. Do you have like a, a magic time for your naps? You know, it's like a Sunday afternoon kind of thing. Like I put, I'll put like golf on or something if that's on. And like golf is the best to nap to. I don't golf and I'm not a golfer, but it's just amazing. To, it's the best ASMR to have like in the background for me. Naps are magical. I mean, I honestly think that's a takeaway from this. Take a nap. It is so yeah. refilling. Yes. Important, important. I will make sure I bullet that out. Okay, last last question I have. So if 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 somebody right now is is struggling, maybe they've taken on a little too much, right? Maybe they maybe they have overextended themselves a little bit, but they're worried about pulling back. And maybe to your earlier point about maybe saying no to some things because. What if these things don't come back around? Or what if this opportunity never strikes again? I should stretch myself now. What's your advice to those people that maybe have, maybe they're feeling stressed out and they're not as, a, you and I, if we met with them, we'd probably immediately say you're doing too much, but maybe they can't see it. And what's what's some of the warning signs and what would be your advice for that? Yeah. Well, the first thing I would say is if they're afraid something's not going to come back around, That's a scarcity mindset, not an abundance mindset. And that will never get you anywhere if you think that somebody's win is your loss. So abundance, have faith that it will come back around, that if you are too loaded, this is not your opportunity, that something different will come around the tracks when you are ready for it. The other thing I would say is listen to your body. Your body will always tell you when you're out of whack. When I was super stressed out in a corporate job with 70 hour work week, I started to get this weird eye twitch. I would be talking to someone. And I'm like, do you see my eye just twitching right now? I never had anything like that in my life. And it was my body telling me that I was stressed out and I was doing too much. And that's where people get sick. They end up in the hospital. Listen to your body when it starts to doing some goofy things. That's a sign that you probably need to just take a break. And overall, listen to yourself. You know when you're loading yourself up and you're saying yes to something that you probably shouldn't. And here's the thing. You can either listen to yourself or you can get a lesson. And that lesson might be, boy, um, I'm not having a lot of fun in my life right now. Or you know what? I'm not sleeping because I took on too much. And you will get it to a breaking point and that's not going to look good. So if you can kind of curb yourself a little bit, listen. And if you in your heart or your gut are just kind of hesitant, take that as a sign that it's not something you actually want to do. And then don't do it. We don't have to do all the things. Yeah, right. Exactly. I, I've known so many people where that's happened. Somebody going through a stressful time at work and they're like, man, I just, I started getting vertigo. I don't know why. Yes. Like, and also listen to your people because your friends, your family, your partner will say, hey, want to see it every once in a while. Your kid will say, hey, can you show up? Those are signs that you are immersing yourself too much in one place because your life, if it's a pie, don't make that pie all about work because that is not a tasty pie at all. No, no, I don't want any of that pie. That's a, a terrible, it's a terrible pie. I would not want it. I like a rhubarb or something. Yeah. Well, it's something with a lot of flavor, a lot of spice, a lot of variety. Yes, And exactly. um, you can all do that by doing other things. And I think making space for that too. And I think what a lot of people forget, especially if you have a family and you're working and you're just trying to like get through the day or the week, you also forget to just think about what is it that brings you joy? And I think if we all followed our joy a little bit more, we would be so much happier. And if your joy is telling you, God, you know what? I don't know why, but Greece, that like Greece is calling me or maybe trying a new restaurant out or maybe you want to learn salsa dancing. Like there is something in you that that wants to try things and you got to listen to that voice and let that person out because You're more than family you and you're more than work you. And it's up to you to uncover those different layers. And that's when you're going to live a fun and fulfilling and joyful life because you're activating all the different parts of you. No, thank you. Thank you for that, Heather. You, 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 you ended the show perfectly with that. Uh, That, that is, that is just beautiful. So Heather, if I want to get in touch with you, if I want to learn more about the marketing work you do, more and more about the book, where are good places to find you and where are you most active? Yes, I'm most active on LinkedIn and Instagram. Awesome. Awesome. Well, so I've learned so much today. I appreciate you taking the time to to share with with my audience. Um, And we'll have to have you back on the show again sometime soon. I would love that. 
We appreciate you taking the time to listen to this episode of Schmidt List. The stories shared by our guests are genuinely inspiring and offer insightful knowledge. It's important to remember that success doesn't happen overnight and requires collaboration, learning, and perseverance. If you want to broaden your professional connections, check out Kurt's book, The Little Book of Networking, How to Build Your Career One Conversation at a Time on Amazon. Please stay connected with all things Schmidt List on social media, leave a review for the podcast, and join our community of like-minded entrepreneurs. Thank you for being part of Schmidt List. Keep innovating, collaborating, and chasing your entrepreneurial dreams.